Well, um, I want to introduce to you uh, one of the greatest pastor teachers, travels all over the world now, training pastors, and I want to say this publicly. Whew. You know, about 10 years ago, I would say it was probably my wife and I, our darkest, lowest part in our ministry life. And Johnny Hunt took us in and he healed us. And I'm forever grateful for him. I honestly say it. I've wanted to say it publicly, and this is the first time I'm telling you this man loves pastors and uh, pastored that church at First Baptist Woodstock for 36 years, a church of just thousands and thousands and thousands of people. It's an incredible church plant. And to take time and to call and say, you know, get your butts down here to Woodstock and just let us love on you. And that's what they did, and we appreciate it. Pastor Johnny Hunt, come preach for us. Would you please welcome... Pastor Johnny Hunt, and uh, the man that travels all over the country with him, Chris Lee, it's nice. I thought I saw you just standing there a second ago. Oh, he went out to get a smoke. I understand that. Okay. <laughs> I love you, Pastor. I love you, man. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate uh, the kindness, and I'm just grateful that um, you, you're able at some point in your life, maybe if Jesus chooses to do it, to sort of uh, let you be with people beyond their pain and to see how they're out there serving and making a difference. And so we're all broken people and uh, we all have a past and I'm just glad that Jesus can get us past our past. And so it's uh, encouraging. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 24 and I just wanna read a few verses of scripture in just a moment. And then preach a biblical message and try to illustrate it as much as I can in the time that we've got together. I really do love Matt and Joy. They've been in our home many times and we've always enjoyed them. And uh, even though we uh, will go seasons, we don't see or talk to each other. I'll read the text or they'll get a text out of nowhere and it's always encouraging. But uh, I love it when you have friends, and this is how you know you have forever friends. You just pick up where you left off, all right? Because life can get busy for all of us, and so I'm grateful. And then what a joy it's been to have uh, their son, Jake, and daughter-in-law, Ashley, and the babies at Woodstock. And so I had the privilege to serve with them for eight years, but to know Jake way back in even the Liberty days. And so um, God has been good. And so I'm enjoying a season of training pastors and leading nationally in evangelism. I want to speak this morning on this subject, missed opportunities. Um, I, I try to write a book a year. Uh, who would have ever dreamed that I would do any writing? I uh, dropped out of school when I was 16. I managed a pool room for four years. I was raised in a project by a single mom. I was arrested for stealing, arrested for fighting. Some of you thinking fighting, you're not that big. I'm not big, but I'm wound tight. And then uh, I was arrested for drunk driving and you know, totaled a car, could have killed the man and myself that night. And that would have been really tragic for our eternal state. And yet um, something happened. I was rescued uh, by the gospel when I was 20 years old. So you never know what God has in store for your life. But in my writing and journaling early in the mornings, I journaled this thought a, a long time ago. I simply wrote, I want to do now what I'll be glad I did then. And there was, there's some things that we can do now that we won't be able to do at another time in our life or life will get away. And before you know it, we'll be out in eternity because life is like vapor and there'll be some things we wish we had done. You know, I, I hate the negativity in statements and we buy into it. For instance, here is one of the proverbs you sort of hear all, all uh, the time when people are, uh, are talking uh, about uh, the future. Uh, you know, they're just always talking about what goes on just in the present tense. They say this, I've never known a man or a woman that when it came time to die, they wish they'd have spent more time in the office. Well, that's all right, but it's very secular. But here's what I want to ask. 
When people did come to die, what did they talk about? If it's not more time in the office, did they say this? I wish I'd have given more for the cause of Christ. I wish I'd have served better. I wish I'd have told my family about Jesus. I wish my neighbors had really known that I was a Christ follower. I wish I'd have made more of Jesus. I wish I'd have been more active in church. And the, the things, I wish I'd have gotten involved in missions. So what, what is it, those missed opportunities, things that cannot be retrieved? And so in the text this morning, let me see if I can whet your appetite. The Apostle Paul is under house arrest in Caesarea by the sea. I've been there, be actual, factual, 18 times, and God willing, I will stand there again in May. Uh, Caesarea by the sea, the land of Israel. He stood before Felix, a governor. Felix left, Festus came in. Festus had a visitor, a Roman king by the name of Agrippa. He came there and he said, let me tell you about this prisoner we had. And then it was Agrippa that said, uh, I want to hear him. And it was Agrippa that said these words. Listen to these words because they'll ring through all eternity. Almost, you persuade me to become a Christian. I like Paul's answer. <laughs> I wish to God not only you, but everyone that can hear me today would trust Christ and become a Christ follower. But we're going to zero in today on a man named Felix and his wife Drusilla. And, and it's going to be intriguing. It's interesting, the information that we can glean from the Bible and from history about this couple. But he's one that would hear Paul and he'd say this, these words. Listen carefully. Uh, go your way for now. When I have a convenient season, I will call for you. And by the way, the Bible says in verse 26 and verse 27 of Acts 24, he called for him on numerous occasions and he would go and speak to him again. But we have no record that that Roman governor ever made the major decision. What a missed opportunity. Now, big deal. Uh, Johnny Hunt is here. I'm a Native American Indian. I'm a half-breed. I'm a Lumbee Indian. Spaniards married Cherokees, 1500s. I'm a product of it. So no big deal. But could you imagine having heard Paul preach, Jesus preach, the disciples preach, the apostle Paul preach, and still go to hell? Wow. I mean, literally, this is biblical truth that I'm preaching right now. This is not a made up, I think so. Uh, this is factual truth in the Bible. So we'll talk about some of my own personal missed opportunities. I'm going to get personal with you, share some things with you, and it'll take the attention off of you. And then when the attention you think is off you, I'll nail you. All right. So anyway, <laughs> beginning in verse number 24, and after some days when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning faith in Christ. Now, every Bible study teacher, listen to these words. Paul is about to share the gospel. Question, when Paul presented the gospel, what did he zero in on? If you read the Beatitudes, that's Jesus' finest hour of preaching. But when you read Acts chapter 24, uh, Paul's going to preach and he's going to use three points lady wrote me one time said what is it about you you always have three points and i said well had you rather i have 10 she never wrote back all right so they liked the three so listen to what he did in his sermon number one he reasoned about righteousness that's point number one listen carefully i want to talk to you about god's righteousness number two he talked to him about self-control number three he talked to him about judgment to come now you may find this interesting recent Survey showed that the most detested theological doctrine of the New Testament in the 21st century is the doctrine of final accounting. People get ticked off. People don't like to be told that God has the final word on their life. We, we want to act like we pulled ourselves up by our own bootstrap. I, I, I'm a self-made man. I'll do what I want to when I want to. You may, you can, you really have that privilege and God will give you that opportunity. But there's coming a day. Every person here, every person that's ever breathed the breath of life will appear at one of two places. First Corinthians chapter three, you will appear at the judgment seat of Christ because you belong to Jesus and there you will be rewarded. You will be rewarded for the good and you will suffer loss because of the bad. 
the Bible says that we will give a final reckoning to God. And in that context, I believe that it's clear that this is what's going to happen. God is going to hold us accountable as to what we did with what he gave us. Uh, the Bible makes it uh, clear in this statement. To whom much has been given, much will be required. So God's going to hold us accountable. But then the other judgment for those that have never been saved takes place. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6 and following. It's called the great white throne judgment. You can't make this up. It's the Lord Jesus Christ teaching part of it and John the Apostle teaching the other. And he says that it's going to be a time where people of the world that have never been saved, it says small and great, that means the poorest and the richest, will be judged together. And it teaches this, everybody there will be cast into the lake of fire. It's the Bible. It's what the Bible teaches. Instead of my human speculation, it's divine revelation. So that even makes this more important that he's telling them this truth. So listen what happened uh, when he preached. The Bible says Felix was afraid. Uh, um, I, I heard a family told one of our neighbors, they said, I'll never go back and hear Johnny Hunt. And said, why? Said, the man scared me. Said, said he scared me. Said, said, the way he made me feel. Like, you know, everybody wants to go to church. They even advertise one church in Atlanta. And in our region, here's what it says. Bring your friends. They will never be offended. Hmm. I think I'm going to take out one and say, bring your friends. Pretty sure every week I'll say something. And this, this may help you, maybe it won't. The gospel is an offense. The gospel is, is contrary to my old flesh and what I want. Uh, so I have to come to Christ. So the Bible says, go your way. When I have a convenient time, I will call from you. And he sent him away. Missed opportunity. The Bible has um, many examples of missed opportunities. Listen to this. Both in service and in salvation. So you may say this morning, well, I'm a Christian. How is this going to relate to me? Missed opportunities in service. Uh, it just came to mind as I stood up here. What if I'd have missed that opportunity? And by the way, uh, it's not real easy to get involved in somebody else's life because we're so busy with our own. And so it's easier to leave a man in the ditch than it is to go and get in the ditch and put him on the donkey and take him somewhere to get him help. I mean, it just, it's just the nature of the beast. And yet Jesus says, you want to get the law and the prophets right? Love me first and love others second. And he said, you can hang everything in the law and the prophets on these two things. Paul, when he preached at Mars Hill, Acts chapter 12, verse 32, the Bible says that after he preached, a bunch of philosophers said, we will hear you again on this matter. Problem. Paul left Athens, never came back again. Missed opportunity. Do you remember in Luke chapter 9, uh, verse 57 and following, where Jesus told the story about those he invited to come and, and follow him as disciples? And the Bible says, and they one by one begin to make excuses. Listen to their excuses. I need to bury my daddy. Uh, I need to go and let my family grow up first. And then my favorite one, I need to find me a wife. After I get me a woman, then I'll come and follow you. Missed opportunities. Hey, listen to my missed opportunities. I have never and never will be invited to a high school reunion because I never graduated from high school. I went to night school and got a GED. So I've never been. So, you know, all the people I did go to school with before I quit, I never get to see them again because I don't get an invitation there. Uh, my wife, boy, she, she, uh, she was so intelligent. Listen to this. I was 18 and Janet had been 17, 17 days when we got married. So he says, why'd you get married so young? It's biblical. Bring up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart. And so basic, I'm just kidding, all right. So, but the bottom line is, uh, November the 21st of this year, we celebrate five decades, 50 years of marriage. Matter of fact, I believe the, uh, thank you. I believe the reason they call it the golden years it's because you survived those years that were not so golden. <laughs> Write that down. People ask me every now and then, did you ever have any trouble in your marriage? Are you kidding? My wife, she could have gone to any college she wanted to. She was an honor student, but she gave it all up 
because God called me to preach. And she went and got a little job so she could support me through school. Missed opportunities in Janet's life was to have gone to some of the places she wanted to go. Hey, Joy, I bet you didn't know this about us. You know, we have two daughters, Holly and Deanna, 45, 42, four grandchildren. But there came a day in our life without even, we didn't ask Jesus one thing about it. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever made a decision without consulting with the Son of God? Yeah. I have. I, that's where I, where I mess up a lot. So one day, Janet and I just said, you know, God's blessed us. We got two children. That's enough. Go get your tubes tied. And by the way, the government will pay for you to have your tubes tied. Insurance will pay. But it won't have any payment to have it undone. And then we both fell under conviction. Look, look at me for a moment. This is personal. We, had, we, we came to the point to say, wait a minute. I've been bought with a price. I'm to glorify God and my body and spirit, which are not mine but God's. I have no right telling God that our bodies are not available if he wants to have more godly seed. So we repented before God and found out they wouldn't help us, so we took all the money we could muster up and had the surgery. But we didn't have any more children. But, but can, I, can I answer a question you're not asking? Now that I'm 67 years old, I wonder. I could have a son about 40 wouldn't that be cool? Another Johnny Jr. that would out-preach me. I've preached all over the blooming world. It would be great. I wonder if my decision, so I'll never know about that decision. It's speculation, but I know this, missed opportunity. I got saved and went and pastored a college setting. After the college setting, I went to seminary and pastored a seminary setting. And then guess what God did? God called me back to the home church I was converted in. So guess what? I became my mother's pastor. So one Sunday morning, my mom called and said, son, not feeling good. I won't be at church this morning. I can see it right now. I'm there. I'm, I'm at a stoplight. I'm leaving New Hanover Hospital. If I take a ride, I can be at mom's house in three minutes to check on her because she's sick. But if I take a left in about five to seven minutes, I can be at Longleaf Baptist Church where I pastor, and I can be early for a deacon's meeting. Let me ask, who under heaven wants to go to a deacon's meeting early? I went to the deacon's meeting. My mom died that night. Missed opportunity. All I had to do, look at me. Make a right turn. The fact that I'm thinking about it now is on my heart and mind then. I can't get it out. All I had to do was take a right, and I could have seen Mom one last time. I'm going to tell you this story and move on. I've got to hurry. Here, here it is. Listen to this. I'm a Christian today because N.W. Pridgen, a carpenter, zeroed in on me and would not leave me alone. Every time I'd see him, here's what he'd say. Hey, did you hear about Drew? Oh, Drew Todd? What? Jesus changed his life. You ought to come to Longleaf Baptist Church. Hey, thanks. Um, Mr. Preacher, I'm not, I'm not in the church. And see, I thought church was for religious people, and I was non-religious. Never, never had gone as a kid. Nobody in my family went. Then he, next week, hey, hey, did you hear about Alfred Joyner? Man, Alfred Joyner was one tough dude. No, uh, what about Alfred? Uh, Jesus changed his life. And, and I didn't understand that, but I was intrigued. You ought to come. So my wife started saying, you know, we need to go to church. To which I responded, if I go, I'm going Mr. Pridgen, I go, and after about four or five weeks, the Spirit of God convinced me of my need for Jesus, and God stepped out of heaven and changed my life. By the way, this is cool. The night I got saved, God was saving the church's next pastor. That's going to take a minute to set in, settle in because you didn't even respond. It's kind of like, so... Did you hear what I said? The night I got saved, God was saving the church's next pastor. That means that in about seven or eight years after I go to college and seminary, God would call me back the pastor of the church, and I had gotten saved that night in the service. God was saving the church's next pastor. So I came back and pastor in the church. I left that church and went to Woodstock in 1986. My phone rang one day. It was Mrs. Edna Pridgen. Here's what she said. N.W. died. Of course we want you to do the funeral. Hey, I'll be glad to. Hey, just want to tell you that when you do the funeral, you're going to be doing it with so-and-so. Oh, uh-huh. No, I'm not either. Back of my mind. 
I don't like so-and-so. So, hey, wait a minute, look at me, look at me. So-and-so's been lying about me, he started to lie about me. I even called him and confronted him, and he don't care, he's still lying about me. I'm dog, I'm going to go down there. So what did I do? Now listen, because I'm leaving after this service, so hang in there. Here it is, listen to this. So I called her back and lied. I called her back and lied. And I said, Miss Pridgen, uh, man, I've got tied up here at Woodstock, and I've got some duties I can't get out of. I'm not going to be able to do the funeral. That was a lie. The Holy Ghost said, liar, liar, pants on fire. How many of you know that if you try to walk with God, you can't do that and get by with it? The Spirit of God brought me under deep conviction. I asked God to forgive me, and then I called Miss Pridgen, and I told her the truth why I didn't go. And by the way, you may say, did you ever get right with that preacher? Uh, I feel like I did on my end, but he still doesn't like me. That's all right. And just for the record, like, you don't know me very well, but can you imagine somebody not liking me? But anyway, that'd be like not liking Matt. I mean, give me a break. Missed opportunity. Did you hear what I just told? I did not do the funeral of the man that is responsible for me to be on my way to heaven because it was a missed opportunity because I let sin and unforgiveness in my heart calls me. See, if you're not right with God today, you're not sure what Jesus may want of you because you can't hear like you ought to. Sometimes people will say, I... They left Woodstock, and somebody would say, why'd you leave? And they'd say this, I, I just didn't get anything out of Pastor Johnny's preaching, to which I respond, hogwash. Good night, I'm telling you, I, I'm t I may not be the best preacher, but I am not boring. I'm telling you, I am not boring. And by the way, it ticks me off. They always say it's the preaching. Why don't they complain about the music? But, <laughs> but it could be. That it's not because I'm not communicating. Stay with me. It could be because they can't hear. So with that in mind, I finally get to the message. So let me just dive in quickly. I want to give you three statements, and I'll do it quickly. Number one, the chance given to Felix. And I want to just ask a simple question. What's the chance of Felix having the opportunity to hear the greatest Christian that ever lived he gave us 13 New Testament books. Most of the New Testament he wrote. And he gets to hear him preach. Well, what is it that Felix knew? The Bible says he had an accurate knowledge of the way. How did he know that? Somebody believes that it was probably because of his wife, Drusilla. Uh, who was Drusilla? Drusilla was the sister of Herod Agrippa I. Who's Herod Agrippa I? He's the one in Acts chapter 12 that killed James, the brother of John, and had Peter in prison, wanting to kill him. But the Spirit of God sent the Holy Spirit in there and set him free. You know the story in Acts chapter 12. But then who was her, who was her brother? If that was her dad, who's her brother? Agrippa the two, second. What did he do? He's the one that Paul's going to stand before in just another chapter in the Bible. So Drusilla, what do we know about Drusilla? Drusilla was acquainted with Jesus, John the Baptist, the disciples, and now the Apostle Paul. Good night. Look at me for a moment. No excuse, no excuse. I had the privilege, I uh, was telling somebody last night at dinner, I had the privilege to go spend the afternoon with Billy Graham 10 years ago. Went to his house, my wife and I. He invited us there. I had done him a special favor when I was president of our denomination. And so he wanted to return the favor. So he said, come spend an afternoon with me. I'll never forget as long as I live. And one of the things I told him that night is we sat there, we talked about several things. But what I'll never forget is he said, I want to tell you about the night that I talked to Winston Churchill. Man, I was all ears. You talked to him. Yeah, I witnessed to him. Here's what he said. I can sm still smell the smoke. I can smell his smoke. He smoked the whole time he was in my room. <laughs> and here's what he said. Billy Graham said, I've never reasoned more with anyone to come to faith in Christ. And here's what Billy Graham said to Johnny Hunt. If he's in hell, he's without an excuse. I told him as clearly as a man can. These people knew the way. 
It, that, that's a word that was designated for Christianity. Uh, Felix had an accurate knowledge of Christianity. He understood what was being taught as to what it takes to belong to Christ. Uh, the way of Jesus Christ had been expounded to him as perfectly. Well, wait a minute. Well, who was he? Who is this Felix? Well, Drusilla was Felix's third wife. I found this interesting from history. Felix's first wife was the granddaughter of Anthony and Cleopatra, for heaven's sake. Uh, while in her teens, Drusilla had been given in marriage to the king of Syria. But Felix wanted her. How's Felix going to get her? He was so wealthy, his family hired a magician. And he lured her away from her Syrian husband. Man, they, these, they got a colored past. But then... Paul goes there, hey, by the way, look at this. <clears throat> this is so good. I didn't say this in the second service, so I'm glad I came to this one so I could hear me say it. <laughs> when Paul began to preach the gospel to him, please hear this. You can preach the gospel to anyone because it don't matter what your past or your problem produced. Jesus is enough. Amen. Don't matter. So he began, first of all, and the Bible gives one word. It says he preached righteousness. I had a sister. She finally came to Christ, but she used to say to me, you think that just you and the people at your church are going to heaven? And I said, Mary, that's not true. I don't think half the people in our church are going. <laughs> and she said, you, you think you're going because you're so good. And I want you to know, I feel I'm just as good as you. Look at me for just a moment. Nobody is going to heaven because they're good. We go to heaven because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. My righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. So I need the righteousness. What happens when a person repents of their sin? Look at it in Romans chapter 3, verse 20 through 26. Clearest passage in the Bible. Clearest passage in the Bible. There's nothing you can do to earn his righteousness but repent and receive it. The Bible says that he became our, it's a big word, propitiation. It means Jesus Christ uh, knew that God was going to pour out wrath on Johnny Hunt and that Johnny Hunt deserved it. And so in the wrath of God's being poured out, Jesus Christ stood between Johnny Hunt and the wrath of God. And, and here's the word propitiation. He absorbed the wrath that I deserve. That I, 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 I deserve. He, he, he took it. He took it and gave me away. So, um. He talks to him about, you need righteousness. So here it is, simple. Nobody can go to heaven without the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that is, I, I, I um, Spurgeon put it this way. <clears throat> Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Um, Paul put it this way, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Um, he became sin that I might become the righteousness of God in him. Uh, Jesus took from me something he did not possess, sin. And Jesus gave me something I did not possess, righteousness. Uh, if it's a ledger, if you're an accountant, my father-in-law was a CPA, had his own company for 50 years. I know what a ledger is. My wife used to work for him. So she understood taxes and doing people's payrolls. And in a ledger, you've always... Uh, got your liabilities and your assets. Over in the area of liabilities, I was a sinner lost without God. And in assets, I had none. But then I, oh, good night. I met Jesus. And I'm telling you, he was loaded with assets. And he was willing to take the sin out of my account, put it in his. And then took the righteousness out of his account and put it in mine. And so I'm on my way to heaven. Hear me carefully. Because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Period. Hey, then he talked to him, his second point of his sermon, second point, self-control. Now, now, first of all, if you're a, a preacher and your attitude is uh, you don't want to ever offend anybody, don't talk to Drusilla and Felix about self-control. Good Lord, they're in their third marriage, hired a magician to lure her away from one. <laughs> they can't even spell self-control. Why would he talk about self-control? Because look, look at me for a moment. When, when you receive the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, 
self-control. God fills you with the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, I believe with all my heart, when you get saved, God fills you with the Holy Spirit. And when he fills you with the Holy Spirit, he fills you with the fruit of the Spirit, and you have self-control. Spurgeon put it this way. Spurgeon said when he got saved, he lost 80% of his vocabulary. Let, let that settle in. Let it settle in. Come on. Come on, church. And then he talked to him about judgment to come. You know, I, I can't prove this, but you know what it makes me think in this text? Hey, you re, would you receive God's righteousness today and let God bring self-control in your life? Uh, we do know he said this. Uh, not now. Uh, come back in a more convenient time. But then he said this. Uh, better not wait because the judgment of God is coming. I, uh, or, uh, I'm going to go wrap it up, cut it, cut it short, because I've got too much going on in here. I could preach another hour. So listen to this. It don't, y'all better be careful, sister. It only takes about three votes. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't need the majority out there. We'll just stay here and preach to y'all. Uh, Matt, when I first got saved, I'd never owned a Bible. Janet went and bought me a Bible on January the 8th, 1973, my first one. New King James Schofield Edition, my friend. So I had no way of studying and knew nothing about what was in the book. I didn't know any songs that you sing in the church. I'd never gone. Mom didn't go. Dad was a drunk. He was off married to somebody else now with several other children. None of my siblings went to church. So this is all brand new to me, all brand new. I can still remember somebody gave me an album by Jack Price. First song I ever learned is Who Am I That a King Would Bleed and Die For. Then I learned another song, Some Golden Daybreak, Jesus Will Come. And I'm telling you, I... I don't know when he's coming, but I'm telling you, he is coming. But the, but the bottom line is, whatever I'd read, I'd go out and share it. I would read what I knew. I, I wouldn't stay home because, look at me. I wouldn't stay home and not witness because of what I didn't know. I would go share what I did know. So I went to see Randy Clark. Randy's an electrician. And I'd been reading the book of Revelation as a new Christian. How many of you know that's dangerous, to be a new Christian and read the book of Revelation? Here's what I'd read. The Bible says there's coming a day in judgment, listen to this, that God will release scorpions on the earth and the scorpions will sting lost people and, and they'll hurt so bad they'll pray for mountains to fall on them and the Bible says and the mountains will flee from them. So I'd been reading that and I went over and I told Randy the gospel and I said, Randy, I want you to get saved. He said, I'm not ready. I said, I just want to warn you. Look out for the scorpions. And so I told him, I said, the scorpion's going to come, they're going to sting you, and you're going to pray for death, and death flee from you, and the mountains will flee from you. Rand, Randy, you better get saved now. The next afternoon, Randy called me. He said, hey, man, thank you for coming by last night. Dude. Man, don't do that again. I said, why, Randy? He said, you know I'm an electrician. He said, yeah. He said, I'm a pretty confident electrician. He said, but today, every time I got ready to put two wires together, I thought, oh, my God, if these are the wrong wires and something goes wrong, the scorpions. Somebody says, you didn't have it right. Yes, I did. But I'll tell you this. I'd rather show and share what I've learned than to sit back and learn all the years some of you have learned in Sunday school, all the sermons you've heard, all the books you've read, and you've held on to all that information. That's good preaching. Good preaching. I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, and it's where the church is today. He reasoned with him of judgment to come. And then I said I was going to quit, but I said that at the early service too. I close with this, the callousness of Felix. How, how did Felix respond? You got a Bible? The Bible says he was afraid. Here's what it translates. The Greek word is the word for trembled. And A.T. Robinson said it's a pitcher's word. Joy, it says that when he preached, the hair stood up on his neck. I mean, he thought, good night. I had a North Carolina uh, state football player to come hear me preach his name's ronnie he's big i'm gonna tell you he was as broad as he was tall he was a big football player came to hear me preach and when i preached that day i don't remember what i preached but it scared him and he couldn't sleep the dude couldn't sleep at night he got so scared from the gospel message so he went to see he went to see a liberal preacher you can't make these stories up it's truth unto god and i close with this story not because i'm through but time's up so, so listen to this. He went to see a liberal preacher and said, uh, I went to hear Johnny Hunt, and uh, man, he preached, and it, it, it is so frightened me. I can't sleep at night. Can you comfort me? He said, oh, yeah. He said, uh, did he raise his voice a lot? He said, yeah. So he screamed some, yeah. 
veins that his veins pop, you know. Yeah, 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 I've seen those guys. Hellfire brimstone. Amen. Hold on just a minute. You better be careful ever calling a preacher a hellfire brimstone or you're going to be in danger of, of cursing the very Son of God who created the place. Jesus preached three times to hell as he did to heaven. Come on, let's get it right. I'm not near as strong as John the Baptist, and I'm John, and I'm a Baptist, but I'm not as strong as John. You know what John, you know what John the Baptist did? John's down at the baptism pool, and he's, he's baptizing some converts, and he sees some religious Pharisees comes, and he's baptizing a person. He baptizes them, brings them up in the water, and he looks down and says, Hey, you bunch of snakes and vipers, who warned you to come? You go and get your life changed, then come back. I've never done that. I've thought about it. So old Ron, Ronnie felt better. Yeah, that Johnny Hunt, he's just, he, he's scaring me. That's all he did. But he couldn't get it out of his soul. A few weeks later, big Ronnie came. And Ronnie surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. And let me tell you about big Ronnie. I'll never forget as long as I for, live. You don't forget this. He's the hardest person to baptize I've ever baptized. And the reason is he was my height, but he was as wide as he was tall. So when he got in the pool, he was the whole width of the pool. So I, I went to put him down. I just couldn't get him up. And, and, and I began to pray, help me, Rhonda. I mean, all the hymns I knew. He trembled and was afraid. But even though he was trembled and afraid, um, go your way for now. Hey, Pastor Johnny, enjoy being with you. Thanks, Matt, for having Johnny Hunt. Hey, Pastor Johnny. Enjoy your trip to Frankfurt and then home to Atlanta tomorrow. But go your way and, hey, maybe, well, hey, maybe at a convenient time, y'all could have me back. Well, when would it be convenient for me to come back and preach the same type of gospel? While people just say, it's convenient. Here's the invitation. Pastor can do whatever he feels led to do. I'm in total submission to my precious friend. Listen to this. People say to me, well, I tell you what, I wish my lost friend had been here today. There ain't, there ain't no way my lost friend would have stayed in his seat. I'm telling you, God's been speaking to me about that. Yes, sir, Reed. Hey, I don't see how any lost person leave that service without coming to Jesus. Right, hold on just a moment, buddy. I know the majority of you have got a testimony just like me. Leave the lost man alone that didn't respond. He doesn't know God. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have the fruit of the Spirit, and he chooses not to respond. That's not who I'm worried about. I want to see him get saved, but I know that nobody can save him but God. All the pressure's on Jesus, not on me. Spurgeon said, I can't save a soul any more than I can create a star. But I'll tell you this, the majority of you here this morning, you know him. He lives inside of you. You believe his word. I'm more concerned about how we respond. And just for the record's sake, I believe when we start being more sensitive and more responsive to the Holy Ghost of God, I believe our lost friends will be more sensitive to the spirit of a holy God. That's just what Johnny Hunt believes in his observation of where the church is. So the question is, so pastor, you come. Here's the question. When's the last time God spoke to you in a worship service? Did, did the spirit of God, I think this is how God works as you preach the gospel. I think it, the Holy Spirit puts his finger on missed opportunities. And, and if they, they're really gone in the past just like mine, I can't do N.W. Prison's funeral. He's gone. But there's some things that I missed. I can go back and make it right. Or I can surrender afresh and anew that I not miss the future opportunities. Father, bless even now as pastor uh, speaks whatever word you put in his heart. We Thank you. We just trust you and love you. Thank you for the attentiveness of this precious people. Thank you for the way you have blessed and used this church to literally populate heaven through its, its days. Continue to do that good work for Christ's sake.